from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And here's what's coming up. K-State's Greg Hanselcheck will respond to questions that have come up about the COVID-19 outbreak as it relates to livestock production, stressing that cattle and other animals are not potential carriers of this disease. He tells you cattle producers to work around your herds as you normally would. Following then, K-State's A.J. Tarpoff advising you cattle producers to start lining out your game plan against fly activity in your grazing herds this spring and summer and what control approaches you'll use. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Cheryl Boyer will talk about the services Extension continues to provide you home gardeners this spring amid the coronavirus-19 situation. All that here on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you aboard on this Thursday. We'll visit now, as we do very regularly, with the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University, Greg Hanselcheck. Greg is routinely with us to talk of topical matters in cattle health management. And Greg, what we'll focus on today is falling in line with everything else that's talked about anymore. That is COVID-19 and how it relates to livestock. That in a moment. But we do want to get out to folks right out that the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State, despite the fact that the university itself is largely closed down, that laboratory remains open for business and of service to the livestock sector. Absolutely. Uh, we are, we're a little bit short staffed right now, but we are running multiple shifts. So we're, we're running from five o'clock in the morning to at least nine o'clock at night in our, in all our labs. And so we're, we're doing all the, all the normal testing. Uh, just a little warning that turnaround times might be a little bit slower. They don't appear to be much slower, just monitoring it. But yeah, we're open five days a week and half a day on, on Saturday and we're doing some weekend work too. So. Certainly don't stop sending samples to us if you have some diagnostic needs. Well, hats off to you and your people for keeping that operation rolling. Are sample procedures as they normally would be? Has anything changed in that protocol amidst this? Well, the only thing that's changed is that the building, of course, is locked down so nobody can come in. So anybody that wants to drop off diagnostic samples, there's a cooler and a a way to call us when they show up at the at the diagnostic lab so we can take those samples in. So the short of it is we're not letting anybody in the building, but we're still taking samples, both necropsies and uh, just regular samples from, from animals. Might note also, Greg, that your duties with the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit entail you going out into the state and responding to livestock health cases as requested. With these current operational restrictions here at K-State, are you are you tethered down now, or are you available to get out and about still and provide that assistance? Yeah, I'm glad I haven't been tethered down on that <laughs> thing. But yeah, we're still available if uh, if veterinarians need uh, need some help, some fresh eyes. If if they're dealing with some some different or some complicated herd health issues, we're we're certainly available, willing, and anxious to to make visits uh, across the whole state of Kansas. So yeah, don't be afraid to call about those kind of things if you have a if you have a need for us to help, we'd be more than happy to help. All right. And if you have any questions, go to the website that the laboratory maintains, ksvdl.org. COVID-19. Well, we've talked before about other diseases in livestock, in cattle, that are based around a coronavirus. There are variations of coronavirus in the animal kingdom at a fair clip, aren't there? Absolutely. Most of our domestic species have one or more coronaviruses that affect them. We've talked about the coronavirus in, in cattle, and producers are well aware that there's a coronavirus that is associated with neonatal 
diarrhea, and then there's another one that we think is now associated with cattle respiratory disease. But I want to make it perfectly clear that our cattle coronavirus is in no way has any relationship with the, the virus that's circulating in the human. These coronaviruses are very, very species-specific, so I just want to make that clear. And that is our main message, which will amplify as we go along here. This is entirely different, COVID-19, than the other coronavirus strains we see in cattle production in particular, in that there is no COVID-19 path for transmission from livestock to humans, Yep, that's exactly right. The FDA, the CDC, and there's other people that are looking at it, but there's absolutely no indication that livestock can be carriers of this COVID-19 and, and be a source of infection to humans, either either through carrying it on their skin or their hair or any, anywhere else. Nor, you say, can it be harbored in animal feed. That's another thing that has risen to the surface, a question that's come up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the yeah, clear that there, we absolutely believe that there's no fear of importing cattle or feed, either one, that uh, we do, you know, again, we do not believe that those two entities have any, any relationship with carrying this virus and exposing humans to COVID-19. So there's no reason that people should not continue to interact with their livestock uh, as they normally would. It should be business as usual, you say. Yeah, absolutely. Again, just producers just need to continue on with life with their livestock, do what precautions they need to do to, to minimize the amount of human exposure they have. But there, there really, at this point in time, is no reason to not keep doing what they do every day with their livestock, uh, whatever it is that they need to do every day. Still, though, Greg, you say that you're receiving inquiries about the potential for individuals testing their animals, their stock, for COVID-19, you're strongly discouraging that. We are, and, and the FDA and the CDC and, and everybody else is discouraging it. If, if an animal owner believes that they've been exposed to COVID-19 and their animals have been exposed and they and those animals are showing sickness, then the, the step that they have to do is to call their local veterinarian. And then what the local veterinarian is going to do is call either the state or their federal veterinarian and then a decision is going to be made on whether to test those animals for COVID-19. Uh, we don't want to just start blankly sampling all kinds of animals for this virus, because, again, we do not believe that they are associated with, with spreading the disease. But before anything, get your local veterinarian involved. That individual can guide the process if need be. Absolutely. And the, and the FDA has uh, has kind of relax the veterinary client patient relationship rules that are in effect so there's there's going to be more leniency as far as veterinarians working with their producers in what's called telemedicine meaning more information being given through videos and, and telephone conversations not necessarily requiring the veterinarian to to make a trip or to actually look at the animals so yeah, by all means, if there's any questions about this disease or about the animals being sick and it might be associated with COVID-19, just producers, please call your local veterinarian for guidance. All right. Well, in unprecedented times like these, people do interesting things. <laughs> We're seeing evidence of that now, and you've noticed this, too, on social media and elsewhere, you say, Greg, that there have been a few raised the idea of utilizing bovine vaccines for coronavirus to address COVID-19 in humans. Another red flag, you say? Yeah, if you just get on the internet and search for this, you'll see that, again, livestock can be blamed by some parts of the population for this disease, which is absolutely not true. But one of the disturbing things is these same uh, entities are, in a way, recommending that perhaps the bovine corona vaccine could be helpful to humans to combat COVID-19. And I, I just want to stress it. It's not going to work. They're two different, absolutely different strains, but that is extremely dangerous to think that we would promote or even contemplate human beings being injected with a, with a bovine oriented vaccine. I just, it is so dangerous. It's, it's incomprehensible that 
people would actually promote that on, on the Internet out there. But they are, and there's the caution. You can inflict great harm to one's person by utilizing off-label any kind of livestock vaccine on an individual. So that that's simply taboo, Greg. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's dangerous and it's crazy what people will do. And, and I think livestock owners know that that's just a crazy proposition, but I just wanted to bring it to everybody's mind that there is a lot of misinformation about COVID-19 and associated with livestock out there. And more broadly, the food supply in and of itself, be it based on meat proteins, other foods, that supply remains utterly safe from COVID-19 being transmitted through foods. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah, milk, eggs, beef, pork, uh, whatever it is, whatever proteins that are produced by livestock owners is is absolutely safe. I don't have to worry about those products carrying COVID-19 to the human population. Lastly, you say there's information on livestock and COVID-19 on the Food and Drug Administration's website. If anybody has any kind of curiosity or question at all about this, they can likely find an answer at that very site, you say, Greg. Absolutely. And, and the actual uh, site is www.fda.gov front slash coronavirus. And that's a that's a really good site. They update it constantly that basically is informing livestock and, and animal owners about COVID-19 and, and livestock in general. Check that out, fda.gov slash coronavirus. And again, that information will provide reassurance, as Greg says, that the COVID-19 form of coronavirus is not going to be vectored from livestock to humans. Greg, thanks for the information on this, and uh, stay well. We will catch up with you again soon. Thank you. That's Greg Hanselcheck. He's the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, Kansas State University. You're tuned to Agriculture Today, and we'll return in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Kansas farmers and ranchers are helping feed your family in the world. The largest contributor to the Kansas economy is beef cattle. How do you get that juicy steak on your plate? In order for you to enjoy your tasty meal, it requires the hard work of the producers, marketers, advertisers, processors, inspectors, transporters, packers, and consumers. So thank all these people and sit back, relax, and enjoy your tasty meal. Agriculture Today continues now. No, it's not premature to address the subject of fly control in cattle herds, as we'll embark on another grazing season in a few weeks now. That's according to our guest. He's A.J. Tarpoff, beef veterinarian with K-State Research and Extension. He's joining us from off campus, as so many are these days, A.J. And right to it, here we are in late March Yet fly control, you think, should be on the mind of cattle producers even this early. It's always good to have a plan and to, and to be proactive and be ready for whatever whatever comprehensive program you're going to develop with your veterinarian to help combat and control these external parasites that really rob us of a lot of performance during the grazing season. And being specific about what we're going after here, there are three primary fly species which can inflict varying levels of trouble in the cattle herd. Yeah, let's uh, let's talk about these major species. So uh, the first one are horn flies. Okay, horn flies cause about a billion dollars a year of losses to our cattle industry every year. That's billion with a B. So uh, these are blood sucking flies that live on the backs of cattle. When you go out and check your cattle first thing in the morning, you'll see all these black flies buzzing all around on the backside up, up along the withers, and maybe a little bit down down the sides of cattle. Uh, those are horn flies. Horn flies lay all their eggs in fresh manure. So as soon as an uh, animal defecates, they will leave the animal, lay eggs, and go right back to that animal. So they spend their whole life uh, actually on those cattle. Now, what's different about uh, horn flies is there is an economic threshold. We kind of have a, a pretty good understanding on how many flies it takes uh, to start really causing an economic loss. And it's about two to 300 flies per animal. 
Uh, now, obviously, I'd never ask a producer to go count flies on the back of a cow. Uh, but realistically, how, what does two to 300 flies look like on a cow? Uh, if you check your cows first thing in the morning, uh, the flies will be about from the elbow up over the withers down the other side. OK, so if the flies kind of take up from the elbow all the way up to the top line, we know that we're losing a little bit of money there. Moving on from horn flies, we also combat stable flies. OK, stable flies, they actually bite on the lower legs of cattle. OK, so whenever we see our cattle uh, stomping their feet, swishing their tail or first thing in the morning, you see them standing out in a pond. They're actually they're not out in the pond to, you know, to cool off. They're actually standing in the pond to get get away from some of these stable flies that are biting. Uh, it only takes a few flies per leg to actually cause a, an ec- economic damage to our animals because of the painful bite there. It disrupts their grazing behavior. Uh, we'll see cattle bunching up again, swishing tails and kind of constant motion. That's how we know we, we're dealing with stable flies. Uh, stable flies, what's different about them is they don't lay their eggs in fresh manure. They actually lay their eggs in decaying organic matter. Uh, so this could be old feeding sites. This could be old bedding sites. Anywhere there, where there's some type of undisturbed organic matter that's decomposing. And then the, the third uh, fly of concern that we deal with are face flies. Unlike the previous two flies, face flies don't actually suck blood or they're not blood feeders. They actually feed off the protein-rich nasal secretions and ocular secretions coming out of the eye of our cattle. Okay, so that's why we see them buzzing around the face. They don't spend very much time on the animal. They'll come, they'll get a feed, and then they'll leave. They also lay their eggs in fresh manure. But we, we our concern with face flies uh, is really the spread of pink eye pathogens during the grazing season. Okay, so those are the key three. And in that, one wants to put together, you say, a comprehensive control program to address all these contingencies. And what are the components that are necessary for that? Okay, so there's a lot of different mechanisms that we can utilize to get insecticides on our cattle or fed through our cattle. Okay, so I think it's important to understand that we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Uh, We have feed throughs. We have topical applications that can be sprayed or poured on. We actually have insecticide impregnated ear tags. So we can actually put these ear tags in the cattle to have a constant amount of insecticide around that animal for protection. We can even use dusters or oilers uh, where the cattle actually go and rub up against uh, some of these tools to be able to apply some of this insecticide on a daily basis. So there's a lot of tools and there's also a lot of different types of products. Uh, There are three different main insecticide classes that we typically utilize, and those would be pyrethrins, organophosphates, and abomectin. Okay, those would be kind of the three different tiers uh, that we typically utilize. Let's talk about the delivery methods individually then. When to get those ear tags put in, obviously before turnout, and moreover, the type of ear tags you'll use this year compared to last year and the year before gets into that rotation that you emphasize. Yes. So uh, ear tags are phenomenal products. You know, we have long lasting effect from whenever we put these tags in but we do have to have a realistic expectation on how long they're actually going to last. If we, if you read your, uh, the label on a lot of those uh, ear tags, uh, we have labeled length of duration of therapy from 12 weeks all the way out to 20. Okay. So th- there's a huge variability on uh, what tag you purchase and how long it's, it's realistically going to be able to last. So keep this in mind. If you're working cows right now and you put fly tags in, it's not realistic to expect that tag to work at its uh, fully functioning in early September, obviously we're, when it's already worn out. So when you put them in, obviously, if, if we could wait to apply some of these fly tags uh, until they've grazed for a couple weeks, we're talking late May, early June, when we really start to see the spike in the horn fly population. If we can wait to apply them then, uh, we'll have longer efficacy into the season. However, that's not always possible or practical because we're not just going to gather our cows just to put in ear tags. OK, so it does have to work within your production setting. So if you do put them in early in the season before turnout, just have that understanding. We may have to come back with a different type of product and treat them late season. Now, within our insecticide classes, it is good to have fly tags. If you're going to use fly tags, we do have to use them in a rotation. Horn flies, unfortunately, they actually develop 
resistance rapidly to a lot of our insecticides. Okay, now we can combat that by rotating these products accordingly. Now that rotation looks like this. If you use a pyrethrin tag, we can only use that no more than once out of every three years. Okay, so a pyrethrin once out of every three years. So what do we do with the other two years in between? You could potentially use a organophosphate for the other two years, an organophosphate tag, or you could truly do a, a three-year rotation with uh, an abimectin tag. So we can have a pyrethrin, organophosphate, and an abimectin. Uh, we put these on the rotation to make sure that we're not going to develop an environment that, that really holds a lot of resistant flies. Okay, so that, that would be our fly tags. Does one then want to complement the ear tags with a topical, a spray, an oil, a dust? What's your thinking on that? So possibly, especially if you put fly tags in early, we can hold off any other treatment until late in the season when the fly tag has kind of lost its, its efficacy. Uh, so what we can do is come back in with a pour on or a spray late season and late season would be August or September where, where we really see another big population spike in some of our horn flies. Um, we can come back there and have an alternate class of insecticide that we would treat them late season. Now, if you do come back through at the end of the season, uh, whenever you run them again, or if you're going to run them through a chute to be able to apply a product, make sure you, you remove that fly tag because there's still quite a bit of active chemical and it, it, it will expose these flies to a, a, a sublethal dose and actually lead to more resistance. So if you use the tags, make sure you pull them out at the end of the season. And about insect growth regulators, the feed-through products, IGRs, those would be administered fairly early on, would they not? Uh, they are. So I really like uh, feed-through products. As long as the cattle are consuming it, it has a major impact on the overall population within a given area. Um, now, these uh, the products that we can feed, we either have larvicides that directly kill uh, fly larvae that are developing, or it inhibits their development. Okay, so if it inhibits the development, it's called what, what we refer to as an IGR. Now, IGRs or larvicides can be applied to mineral. Now, if you're going to use an IGR, we typically base on when we try to put it in into production is based off kind of our average population spikes of these parasites. And for Kansas, for the vast majority of Kansas, it's really April 1st it is kind of the key date that we try to start implementing and feeding some of our IGR to larvicide products around April 1st, beginning of April. That way we have active amounts in the environment before those populations start to rise in the spring. So be selecting those products soon is your point here and prepare to get them out there as soon as possible, AJ. Absolutely. Now is the time to have that plan in place. If you're going to be purchasing minerals soon anyway for the grazing season, this is something to have on your checklist to go out have those conversations with both your veterinarian, with your local supplier, and make sure they have uh, what you need on hand. Well, producers, if you haven't begun your planning process now for, again, comprehensive fly control in the herd, it is high time you did so. As AJ says, consult your practitioner locally if you have any further questions about amping up that campaign against those flies. AJ, thank you for the input, and we'll catch up with you again soon. It's always a pleasure. That from beef veterinarian A.J. Tarpoff of K-State Research and Extension. We'll be back here on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Now in our 96th year of broadcast service to agriculture in Kansas and the Central Plains, this is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines coming your way, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, agricultural leaders broadly expressed relief for inclusion in that massive $2 trillion stimulus bill for the U.S. economy. Among the aid to specific industries, including a $14 billion boost in funding authority in the USDA's Commodity Credit Corporation funds, that would allow the USDA to provide more direct aid to producers. The CCC program has been depleted this year because of the market facilitation program. The new funding would allow the USDA to provide more aid. That legislation also included a $9.5 billion assistance program that would mostly be directed to assist livestock operations, including dairy producers, as well as fruit and vegetable and other specialty crop producers, farmers who sell directly to farmers' markets, to schools, and to restaurants would also be eligible for aid. Beyond the direct aid to farmers, the bill also includes an additional $15.5 billion for the USDA's Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. That's the single largest food aid program in the country. Child nutrition programs would receive another $8.8 billion. And USDA's rural development programs would receive $25 million for distance learning and telemedicine programs. Lawmakers cited the value in boosting telemedicine as a way to treat patients without having the possible spread of COVID-19 for people who do not need hospitalization. Another $100 million also would go to further boost rural broadband. Other provisions throughout the bill include more funding for food banks and local food pantries. Difficult economic times ahead for the U.S. are poised to unfold with the COVID-19 situation, but consumers are still not faced with sticker shock at the grocery store, according to the latest update from the USDA. USDA is looking for overall U.S. food prices to increase here in 2020 by one and a half to two and a half percent compared with last year. That's nearly in line with the increase of 1.9 percent registered last year. Grocery store prices forecast to increase a half a percent to one and a half percent. That's very much in line with the increase of just slightly lower than one percent in 2019. Grocery store prices have a 20 year average increase of two percent. And food away from home, that is restaurant prices for 2020, are now seen rising from one and a half to two and a half percent. That is down from the month ago outlook for prices for eating out. They said that they would rise by two to three percent at that time. That increase now forecast by the USDA considerably under the 20 year average of 2.8 percent. The situation with COVID 19 is making farm biosecurity more important than ever before, as one expert tells the USDA's Gary Crawford. Most livestock producers are very aware of the importance of maintaining strong biosecurity practices to keep outside diseases from infecting their herds or birds. But one expert says with all that's going on with the coronavirus, all farmers should take biosecurity measures to keep diseases from infecting people on their farms. Part of that is to limit farm access. We don't want people on our farms who shouldn't be on our farms. And the University of Minnesota's Dr. Jeff Bender says among those people who should not be on the farm, those farm workers who are sick. If we're sick, we need to stay at home. Even if we have mild symptoms, asymptomatic folks may uh, or folks with mild symptoms may uh, transmit uh, this virus. The other is just to wash your hands frequently and to use hand sanitizer if we can't wash our hands frequently. He says people working on the farm should keep as much distance between each other as possible. Bender says, though, doing all of this doesn't totally guarantee the virus won't be transmitted onto the farm or from one person to another. But we want to really limit the potential for transmission. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And want to let you know right here, the Department of Agricultural Economics at K-State will be hosting a series of online gatherings starting this evening on the economics of agriculture during the COVID-19 pandemic. That'll take place at 7 o'clock this evening. The theme for this opening round of the series, further updates on the macro economy from K-State's Brian Brigham. It'll start at 7 o'clock. Registration is limited to, to 300 people. And And you can find out more about this opportunity taking place this evening at 7 at agmanager.info. Look into that. Now it's time for the Kansas Soybean Update with Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Shelby Neal, Director of State Governmental Affairs for the National Biodiesel Board, joins us. And Shelby, for almost a decade, California's low carbon fuel standard program has been in effect. A lot of the focus has been in its effects on gasoline, but it also affects biodiesel. So what is biodiesel's role in the LCFS? The National Biodiesel Board's been partnering with the Kansas Soybean Commission for over a decade to develop a market in California, and it's just gone amazingly well. The market for biodiesel has gone from 14 million gallons in 2011 to over 800 million gallons last year. So it's just unprecedented growth, and and we're really excited about this collaboration that we've had with Kansas and and the results for farmers. Now, in the uh, low-carbon fuel standards out in California, it is an incentive for those to use the biodiesel because of the credits they're able to earn. 24 states now have comprehensive greenhouse gas reduction goals and requirements. So this is going on all around us. And the challenge is finding low carbon alternative fuels. And biodiesel is the best one of those. It's the least expensive. It has the best carbon score of any of those. And so that brings a lot of additional value. For example, when the biodiesel plant in Wichita, Kansas sends fuel to California, they get a credit of over a dollar because of the low carbon score of that fuel. So not only is it 800 million gallons in California, it's 800 very profitable gallons. And the growth in California proves that the demand is out there for a product like biodiesel. I would go so far as to say the people who use biodiesel just love it. It enhances the durability and performance of engines. It burns 50% cleaner. It reduces carbon by 80%. It's, it's sold at prices that are very similar to petroleum. And we haven't had a single issue in California ramping up from 400 million gallons to 800 million gallons. Truckers love it too. You'll see B15 to B20 at a lot of truck stops along I-70 in Kansas and other places. Is there anything that would hamper the continued growth of biodiesel out in California? It used to be people wanted to use 5% blends of biodiesel and they wanted to use 10 and and now 20% is actually the most common blend probably of biodiesel in the market. Well, now they want to use 50% blends of biodiesel or completely eliminate petroleum in the gallon and use 100% biodiesel. So there's still R&D work we need to do with that, with things like Underwriters Laboratory and ASTM. And, you know, the California market, for example, is going to be 2 billion gallons by 2030. Shelby Neal, Director of State Governmental Affairs for the National Biodiesel Board, joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today and our weekly horticulture segment. And the theme here will address our atypical times around and about now because of the COVID-19 situation, how it's influencing K-State Research and Extension's ability to get information out to gardeners across the state and beyond. We've invited in today, and we'll have her back next week as well, Cheryl Boyer. Cheryl is the Extension State Leader for Horticulture at Kansas State University. Cheryl, before we go any further, just to uh, say what is obvious, this has been a time of tremendous adjustment for everybody, most assuredly as you and your team continue to provide information and help the public out there with their gardening pursuits, right? That's true. And I would say we're still in the middle of the transition and um, we're working our way through it. But by and large, I've been really pleased with Uh, the positivity and the engagement that we've had across the system with people figuring out how to make things work. But there's still a lot of issues to work out. So we're working through those. And especially a lot of concerns from our horticulture agents is the upcoming growing season. So we've been ironing out how we're going to make that work and what that looks like this year. And of course, it's going to look different. 
And if there were ever a time for information to get out, this would be it, because the encouragement for folks who have been bound up at home because of the coronavirus, they need to get out and enjoy the the fruits, if you will, of lawn and garden activity. They do. And we're just beginning to enter the gardening season. So right now is a fantastic time for people to do some planning and figure out how they're going to make it work when they have time and resources and space and to do some gardening, whether that is flower gardening or vegetable gardening. I know I'm going to be doing a little bit of both. And so I'm thinking through how that works at my house and also thinking through how I can use those lessons to teach my kids some homeschool science and art. And I'm so grateful that we have lots of K-State Research and Extension resources to help think through that for lots of different scenarios. And, and we have resources from a situation where you're in an apartment and you all you have is a patio to plenty of space and all the resources that you need. But in my situation, um, my soil's not great, but lots of resources are available for both starting your own seeds if you want to do that and for shopping at garden centers. They have been learning to adapt to this challenge and Nationally, it's been quite a conversation about garden centers and other horticulture businesses being considered essential services. So we're appreciative of that. Well, since we're on the path of what extension can provide, let's talk about two specifics here, which over time have been utilized readily by gardeners. The Soil Testing Laboratory at Kansas State University, for those who need to know about the nutrient content of their their garden soil or their flower bed, is it still open for business? It is. So um, as the university has transitioned over the last week or so, it was at a bit of a reduced capacity, but I'm really pleased to report that I spoke with the state extension leader in agronomy yesterday, and he assured me that they are back to normal operations. The only challenge is the doors are locked to the building. So they have set up some alternative ways to accept soil samples. So there are some instructions. And for sure, I definitely encourage you to check with your local county agent. Um, If you're near Manhattan, and you can get it to campus, this is true for any soil sample. So um, homeowner samples, farmer samples, whatever you've got that you need analyzed, there's a drop box outside of Throckmorton Plant Sciences Center. And there's a map on their website. So if you just search KSU soil testing lab, All of those resources are online, and they also have a link to where you can set up a UPS shipping label and ship directly to the lab from your home. And then there are also some resources for agents to be able to, at request, have a a box and a sample sitting outside the extension office that you can pick up if you're not under a stay-at-home order. Same question about the Plant Disease Diagnostic Laboratory at K-State, which is usually quite busy starting about now and for the next several months, actually. That's true. So it's busy season for everybody in horticulture, and the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab is no different. They've been trying to figure out solutions for receiving samples. They are at fairly normal capacity as well. So you can ship it to the regular location, but it goes to Central Mail, and they'll only be picked up twice a week. And if you know anything about plant samples, if they're not retrieved quickly. So we always recommend not to ship them on Fridays because if they sit in shipping over the weekend, sometimes they're mush by the time they get to the diagnostic lab. So they have actually set up an alternative location for people to ship their samples to. And I just received that information and I'm sure it will be posted on the website and made available um, very soon. But it is um, KSU Plant Diagnostic Lab, 1310A West Loop Place, number 351 Manhattan, Kansas, 66502. So that will be available on the website. Again, check with your county agent. They'll have this information and um, we'll be doing our best to get a hold of those samples and get you some answers. I would also recommend, you know, we're doing lots of video things these days. If you have a smartphone, take some photos that are are close up of the problem, far away from the problem, and then also do a video. You can submit a video via email and our agents can see that. I think home site visits are going to be limited or in many cases non-existent. But if you can take a video of what you're looking at, then that's also great feedback too. So I recommend that path. 
capitalize on the technology, never more important than it is right now. Briefly here, other things that Extension promotes in as far as support for gardeners out there. The Master Gardener Program comes to mind right away. What's its status, Cheryl? So the Extension Master Gardener Program We've got lots of active master gardeners who are kind of chomping at the bit. So we've been talking about lots of online resources that we are going to make available as a list. We're hoping to engage people in Facebook quizzes and conversations and working really hard to keep our extension master gardeners involved. It's a volunteer organization promoting what we do in extension and helping answer homeowner questions. So that's a big piece of what a lot of the master gardeners do is they help with hotlines and answering questions that agents get. So we're having to modify how we approach that as well. Cheryl, we need to break away, but we'd like to bring you back next week and share more about how garden centers, the commercial sector, are adapting to social distancing and and all the other aspects that are going along with the coronavirus situation. We appreciate the update on extension activities in the horticultural field, and we'll talk again next week. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks. Cheryl Boyer is the extension state leader in horticulture at Kansas State University. Thanks for tuning in. Please be back right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.